Good evening. It's a joy to greet you tonight. Those of you that are present and those that here are watching live stream, we thank the Lord for that. And for those of you that are tuning in in Africa, I know some of you mentioned that you're going to stay up till midnight just to tune into this service. So if you were able to do that, we welcome you to our service tonight and know that we are praying for you and we're praying for all the brethren here at Lehigh Valley Baptist Church and uh, just looking forward to the day that we can fellowship together Amen. as God called us to in his body, in the church. How important that is. Amen. We miss it. And some of you are feeling like what missionaries go through on the mission field, huh? away from the church. Sometimes we don't have the, the uh, comforts of fellowshipping like you do here. And you certainly feel that. So I think uh, we can all uh, learn some lessons from this time and, and understand uh, what the Lord has for us as a church. I want to preach tonight out of Hebrews chapter 3. And I know... Uh, a lot of the messages I've been able to share with the brethren in Africa really are encouraging messages to help them through this time. Uh, some of it out of the Psalms, many messages out of the Psalms. And, but tonight I just believe the Lord would have me uh, preach out of Hebrews chapter 3. And it's really not an easy text. It's not something I just pulled out of the files, but... Uh, wrestling with it over and over again, and, and it's really spoken to my heart, and really the importance I think you'll see from this text. Come, uh, we'll begin reading in verse number seven, and we'll go down tonight just to, well, we'll read to the end of the chapter, but we will definitely not cover that many verses tonight, but I want to preach about the dangers of a hardened heart and an unbelieving heart. The dangers of a hardened heart. This is found in our text tonight. Let's begin by reading and we'll have a word of prayer and get into the message tonight. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works, Forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you tonight for the privilege to gather together here with some of the brethren. Uh, we thank you for those tuning in tonight. And Father, we need to hear from you. And uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be the one who takes control of this vessel, that I could be a vessel in your hands. And Father, I pray for those that are tuning in. We know there's so many distractions at home. So many distractions as you look uh, through the Internet and, and so on and so forth. And we just pray, oh God, that you will arrest our attention tonight, that we would truly 
focus in on your word and we would focus in on the message you have for each one of us tonight. So, Father, um, bless uh, the brethren in Africa, Lord. Our hearts go out to them even tonight, just hearing of the increasing cases uh, throughout South Africa and Botswana and uh, just even in villages now that uh, we thought were going to escape this. Lord, uh, certainly we pray that the gospel will go forth uh, even at this time that you will have mercy upon these people and that you will save souls and, and, and lift people up at this time, supply their needs. We think of our brethren, Lord, who are suffering in many ways, Lord, without jobs and income. We know how hard it is here in America, and we know that's doubly hard in Africa, Lord, or even tri triple times hard, Lord, of what they suffer and to scrape together their next meal and so, Lord, help them, have mercy upon them. And then, Father, help us to remember them in our prayers and to reach out to them in love and support them at this, these difficult times. Be with our missionaries as well, Lord, all around the world. Lord, be with them to, as uh, some of them are already resting. Some of them are in a new day. And, uh, Father, just strengthen them, use them at this difficult time. Give them open doors, even though, Father, uh, evangelism is difficult. But, Father, bless them and use them at this time. And may we see uh, fruit that abounds, Lord, even at this time. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to, by way of introduction, talk about the importance of the heart. You know, there are a lot of issues of the heart that are emotional issues. And I think some of them are the most difficult kind that we can put our finger on and actually deal with them. Some of these happen when um, emotional pain that people suffer, maybe from abuse, different kinds of abuse growing up. We don't know. Uh, people go through a lot of crises in, in their lives and and they do and that's something that I've really been meditating on how difficult it is to deal with people's hearts if you think about the area of emotions and how that we can really sort that out in a biblical way and minister to people but then that's why I stumbled on some of this in uh, God's text here about the hardening of a heart you know, that process of hardening the heart. That process of un, uh, having an unbelieving heart. And I hope that tonight, uh, it doesn't matter who's here or how many years you've been saved. Just make sure you understand. He said, brethren, take heed. Mm -hmm. That's the, in light of the context, we, we know a lot about the book of Hebrews and in the sense of uh, the Jews wanting to go back and turn away from Christianity, go back into Judaism, the temptations that were there through suffering and persecution. That is an overriding theme. And then I think in the area of salvation, there were some professors that were not truly saved. That is also true in, in the book of Hebrews. And there's a lot of passages that deal with that. But it is uh, something that we need to look at the importance of the heart. The heart is mentioned in the Bible over a thousand times, almost a thousand times. That's that's a lot. The heart expresses the whole being of man. His mind, emotions, uh, will, desires, attitudes. And remember, after the fall of man, going back to Genesis chapter 3, all of this, the mind, the emotions, the desires of man were tainted by sin. And this is where we find ourselves today. As Jeremiah clearly states, Jeremiah 79, the heart is deceitful above all and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Because of this, 
We are blind. Now, I, that's the warning. I, we are blind to just how pervasive the problem is. Because our hearts are desperately wicked. But aren't you thankful Jeremiah 17, 9 is followed up by verse 10? <laughs> because if we were just left ourselves, that the heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it, we'd be in a terrible mess. We are in a mess already. But that would be, talk about desperation, depression, despondency. We would never get out of it. Isn't that right? But Jeremiah 17 says, I, uh, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Psalm 44, 21, shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Amen. Now, even as we deal with this passage, I don't know how far we're going to get into it. And I just have to probably cut this off tonight. Sorry about that. But I hope what I d I'm able to deliver is good and a blessing to you. But just step over to chapter number four. This is the thought I had about, you know, even the heart is mentioned over and over again in the book of Hebrews. Not just in the text we're dealing with, but throughout the book. But there's some hope in these verses. Look at verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner, amen, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Are you thankful tonight? The word of God is able. The word of God is able. And it can, it can work in us. And then a sobering thought, though, is verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Let's remember that God knows our hearts. You see, outwardly, we can appear as Men of God, and as we heard even in the morning, the challenge of being a true servant of Christ, a true minister of Christ, amen? But you can have all the outward appearance of a great Christian. I think some of the, this was the challenge of the book of Hebrews. They, they were professing Christianity, and uh, yet on the inside, your heart could be wandering from God. Your heart could be dabbling in sinful thoughts and unholy thoughts and even disbelieving God and not trusting him. And this is what God sees. This is what God is going to judge in us. Not the outward appearance, what everyone thinks about us, but he knows our hearts. He knows the secrets of our hearts and he's going to judge accordingly. That should sober us up tonight. This should be a sobering passage to all of us. Because there is a danger of hardening your heart. There's a danger of an unbelieving heart. Jesus himself spoke about our hearts. He says, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Our problem is a heart problem. It's not the external that's the problem. It's the internal that's the problem. That's why Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, uh, apart from Jesus Christ, of course, he is wisdom embodied, amen? Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. Now, pastor, 
was preaching, I believe uh, maybe two weeks ago on a Wednesday night, Psalm 95, and this text comes right out of Psalm 95. And he laid some of the backdrop, and uh, it's, it is connected to verse 6, just so you kind of get that uh, we're in chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? Wherefore? As the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. So whatever we read out of Psalm 95, this lengthy quotation is connected to what we're learning about Jesus Christ in the book of Hebrews. And, and it is applicable to us today, and I'll show you that in a moment. This generation did not hold fast. That generation coming out of Egypt, the first generation, only a few exceptions. They missed out on the blessings of God. They missed out on the rest, both temporally, uh, temporally and in the time that they were living and eternally. How many of them were not saved? You see, their unbelief cost them everything. And that's why he continues quoting here. He wants us to see the, the dangers of unbelief, an unbelieving heart. He says, first of all, let's see tonight the divine pronouncement. There's a warning to hear, a warning to hear. What does he say? Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, if, today, if ye will hear his voice. Now, it's important to know that that is in the present tense. <laughs> the Holy Ghost saith. And he's speaking about the force, the, the divine authority, the divine authorship of the word of God right here, that the spirit of God is speaking and it's, it is today if you will hear his voice. You see, it's just not revelation of the past, the, the old uh, writings of the Old Testament, the prophets. It is the voice of God speaking to us through his word. Do we really understand that this is tonight God speaking to us? And he's telling us that there is a warning to hear, to hear. His voice of authority is calling us to attention, to attention. There's an urgency. It says today there's an urgency, brethren. It's not, you know, it's really urgent. And I don't think I, I don't think we really take the word of God. We get set in our traditions. We get set, you know, we can come and just tune everything out. We could our minds could be somewhere else as we're sitting before the word of God and and that's the dangers of sitting at home and saying that's church. No, there's nothing going to take the place of you sitting before the, the word of God uh, present in, here in body. And you are hearing the word of God and fixed upon the word of God. Nothing can ever take. In fact, you couldn't even fulfill the rest of these warnings without being in the assembly being in the assembly. So how important is the assembly? Do you see that he repeats this today, today, several times throughout our text? And not only several times throughout our text, but throughout the book. It's not just one time here. And I believe he's telling us how we really are, what our hearts are really like. You see, our hearts have a tendency to procrastinate in spiritual matters, to put it off. How many times have we heard the word of God and God has convicted our hearts and we've just put it off? We didn't make a decision. We didn't act upon it. 
We didn't do what the Spirit of God was showing us to do out of the Scriptures. And we just think we're going to drift along like that. That we're going to get by. Brethren, it's dangerous. And I hope that we would learn to take immediate action. That this hearing is not just, you know, hearing the sounds. It's hearing with your heart. It's paying attention so that we can obey the word of God. Is that how we listen to scripture? You see, it demands our action. We should come to the conviction that when scripture speaks, God speaks. Amen. And when God speaks, we must take immediate action. So the warnings run through this text that if we fail to hear, to give heed to what he's telling us about, we face the danger of hardening our hearts. Hardening of, a heart, of our hearts affects our hearing. Now get this. We can procrastinate, we can put it off, and then we, our hearts, something happens. You can heart, your heart can become hardened and because of not paying attention, not taking action of what God wants you to do. And that hardening can lead to unbelief and disobedience, and it will definitely lead to God's judgment, to God's judgment. So we see a divine pronouncement, a warning to hear. We see divine punishment, warning from the wilderness wanderings. Verse 8 and 9. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, prove me. They s and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. So we see divine punishment. And this is a warning from the wilderness wanderings. We, we see that what was written, as Paul says to the Corinthians, remember that text, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. Now all these things that happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, immediately, brethren, I, I think maybe we think we're above this. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, Amen. lest he fall. <clears throat> Without belaboring the point of remember what they saw, the Israelites in Egypt, the mighty works of God, the power of God, the deliverance of God. They were in bondage 430 years. God led them out with a strong hand. He spoiled the Egyptians in the process. They worshiped the Lord at the first Passover. The firstborn of everyone else in the land was being put to death. And Pharaoh sent them out. They came to the Red Sea. They witnessed the Lord's power as he opened up the sea. And they crossed on dry ground while their, their enemies mired in the mud and drowned in the receding waters. They witnessed that with their own eyes. But no sooner than they had celebrated the Lord's mighty deliverance, what did they do? They come to Mara and they complained and murmured and wept bitterly because of the bitter waters. And God provided sweet water. Isn't he a merciful and loving God? Even in this condition, God took care of them. Then they murmured and complained about not having any food. And God provided food for 40 years, manna. And then he provided manna in the morning, quail in the evening. At Rephidim, they quarreled and murmured again because they had no water. Therefore, the Lord commanded Moses to strike the rock with his staff and water could come forth. 
Again, the Lord provided for this murmuring people. Moses named that place Massa and Meribah, testing and quarreling as a reminder of Israel questioning, is the Lord among us or not? Wow. How could they even ask that question? Is the Lord among us? When they just witnessed all the miracles. They provoked him. This is that word coming from Meribah. A trial. So he was. He wanted uh, to hearken back to Psalm 95. Describing this very scene. But it's so sad that it didn't stop there, did it? It, it continued. It continued. They saw the glory of God. They saw the power of the Lord, but they did not believe him. It continued at Rephidim. It, it continued on and on. And, and uh, I think of. Uh, coming to Kadesh Barnea, to the edge of the promised land, the ultimate test of their faith. And would they obey God? Would they enter the land? Would they really enter the rest that God had for them? Or would they follow the majority report that said the land was everything that God had declared it to be, but it was too difficult? God, when they refused to believe the Lord, at that moment, God pronounced his judgment upon them. Toward the end of that first generation of Exodus, they again had no water. And they again complained and murmured. Here, Moses lost his temper. He disobeyed the Lord himself. He, he struck the rock twice for water to come forth instead of commanding it to come forth as the Lord had instructed him and Moses called that place Meribah or contention. Where your fathers, he's talking about where they tried me. They tested me. They tempted me. They proved me. They saw my works for 40 years. But for 40 years, they complained. They murmured. They grumbled. They were in contention for 40 years. And it provoked the Lord because of their unbelief. And it is only their unbelief that kept them from experiencing God's blessing and God's bless, uh, best for their lives. Do you notice what the Lord says in verse 10? How does the Lord feel? Remember verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith. Brethren, he's speaking to us. God was grieved. God was angry. And even in verse 11, he says, so I swear in my wrath. God's anger. He was weighed down with a sense of indignation. He was exhausted by their constant murmuring, complaining. Does God get angry? You know, a lot of people don't want to talk about, does God get angry? But the Bible is clear that God is not impassive or indifferent in the face of sin. Now, let me ask you, if God was angry with the people to whom he graciously revealed himself and the might of his power, how much more with those that have heard the gospel? They've seen its beauty. They sensed its urgency, yet they turn away from the gospel. Now, God's anger... Is not a temp temper tantrum. God's anger is not something. He's not just having a fit that he's going to get over eventually. God's anger is a settled, righteous anger. It's holy in its disposition. It's holy in its action. And this, to this anger, is which our writer refers to in this text. A settled, righteous anger. Holy anger of God. Look at chapter 10, verse 31. He later speaks about this. 
chapter 10, verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He understood something of this divine indignation towards sin and ultimately towards the sinner that rejects him. So we see God's anger. We see also God's assessment. They all, verse 10, they do all the air in their hearts. He knows their hearts. Now, what are they doing in their hearts? They err. This means to wander. You see, they not only wandered geographically for 40 years and they wandered in their hearts for 40 years. That's pretty sad. And this wandering, this word describes a star wandering out of its orbit, not following the right path designed for it. And this is truly the condition of a heart that is in rebellion against God. It's gone astray from God. There's, you see, in the Bible and, and what God is talking about here, there's not any room for partial obedience or part-time believers. God's answer, not only is it anger, his assessment, his answer in verse 10, they have not known my ways. And how often do we think? You know what the answer is? More knowledge. Don't we think, don't we think that? You know, if we just give them this understanding of this and more knowledge of that, then they, they'll finally get it. But listen, they knew the word of God. They had heard the word of God. But the problem was, was and is they did nothing with it. They did nothing with what they heard. They have not known my ways. Their ignorance was culpable. It wasn't innocent. They chose this ignorance. They were not simply blamed for not knowing, but for not, but for not knowing the things they should have known and the things they should have acted on. That's why they were judged by the Lord. God says to neglect opportunity is a serious matter. It is a serious matter. And then God's action. What does he say in verse 11? So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. So did God let their sin slide? Did God just turn his back away from them? No, he didn't. You see, this scene, verse 11, takes us to Kadesh Barnea. We're not going to have time, but if you want to jot down, it'd be a good time to go read Numbers chapter 14, verses 26 to 33. God, Moses was pleading with the Lord not to destroy the people. Do you remember that? Now, God said, I'm, they shall not enter into my rest. Now, the rest here is referring to Canaan land rest. Now, let's just think about rest in the Bible for a moment. Before we do that, let's go to chapter 4, verse 1, just so you understand. There's a, there's a much fuller meaning of rest here. Not just Canaan, when it gets later into the rest, as in chapter 4, We'll refer to that in a moment. But he says in verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left, left us of entering into his rest. And if you should seem to come short of it. Now, when you think of rest, there is the past rest of the Sabbath rest and Canaan rest. The present rest, this concerns us, which also leads to future rest. The present rest is salvation rest. Amen. And not only salvation rest, you get a rest when you come into Christ. 
It is also submission rest. When you are uh, surrendered unto the Lord and you're getting victory through Christ, that certainly is a rest. There's a present rest, but then the future rest is heaven itself. Amen. The very presence of God. What is that going to be like? But there is a rest for the people of God. It's a salvation rest, what you find in Christ. It's not found in the Sabbath anymore, amen? In keeping the law. It's found in Christ. And that's what this book is about. So there's a divine punishment. There's a divine pronouncement. But aren't you thankful tonight there's a divine prescription? And this would take us into like two or three more messages, but oh well. I'll just kind of cover a little bit of the ground. They were embattled Christians right here. They were suffering. There was a lot of temptation for them. And, you know, that's why he's giving this background. But then it's the application to them and to us in verse 12. What does it say? Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. There is so much here. So much here. Keep in mind, we're not talking about a believer losing his salvation. Rather, the message is a warning that there are some, perhaps even among us, who profess to be Christians that are not. Their false profession will be revealed by an, un, by an eventual unwillingness to pers- persevere in the faith. So the writer encourages perseverance by warning against its neglect. What are the imperatives here? There are two imperatives. There are two commands. Take heed, brethren. Amen. Take heed. Now, we believe in the inspired word of God. Amen. This also is in the present tense. And this means to us, this serves as a reminder, we are to live constantly with vigilance. It's not just something we do in a crisis situation. It's something we must constantly take heed of. Because our own hearts could drift through unbelief. Now, these brethren were like us. They were enjoying the fellowship of the saints. They were enjoying the preaching of the word. They were part of the body there. Amen? And so it does apply to us. It does. So the first, I believe we need to guard our hearts. We need to guard our hearts. Personally guard our hearts. Do you see that it speaks of an evil heart? What happens in the heart, brethren? It's when the heart gets into an evil state of harboring sin, cherishing cherishing sin, permitting unholy thoughts and desires. They remain unchecked and unjudged. Then we need to beware. Why? That evil heart is unable to believe God. That Evil heart is unable to respond to the word of God. This is serious. Because when you have that harboring sin, that evil state of the heart, our thoughts become confused. You know, it's like living in a cloud. Your eyes become blinded. You can't see even the peril of drifting from God. But that drifting becomes imminent. 
But he says, take heed. He says, it's an evil heart of unbelief. 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 Brethren, unbelief is not the ability to, uh, inability to understand. Let's make it clear. It's not the inability to understand, but it is the unwillingness to trust God. You see, they had an unbelieving heart for 40 years because they did not trust God that he would fulfill his promises. Just think how they were attacking the character of God, questioning the character of God. It involves the heart. Do you see that? What does it say in verse 12? lest there be in any, any of you an evil heart of unbelief. It involves the heart. It's, 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 it involves the will, not the intelligence. And because it's a product of an evil heart, the solution is not a good argument. Uh, you know, a good message on uh, a creation and, and the existence of God. It's not about uh, apologetics and proving to someone. No, it is a matter of repentance. It's a matter of brokenness. It's a matter of forsaking sin. That's how you deal with an evil heart. I guess I better just call the message the danger of an unbelieving heart because we're not going to get to the hardening heart, all right? Sorry. So change that title, sister. All right, got it. Because I need to conclude that I thank you for your time. But I do want to just finish up on this sin of unbelief, an evil heart of unbelief. Unbelief we should say is the worst of all sins because it is the root of all sins. Unbelief is behind every other sin that people commit. Remember Satan in the Garden of Eden? He tempted Eve. He got her to disbelieve the word of God. He said, to her, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. What he was saying in essence, you really can't believe that, can you? You can't believe God. You see, brethren, if people really believe God, they would not practice any of these terrible sins mentioned here, in, even in this book. And they, they would know that there would be, they would face severe judgment but by not believing God, what happens? When you don't believe God, you do as you please. You do as you feel. So unbelief is the root of all sins. And I believe unbelief leads into that hardening of the heart. There is a connection. Because sin is like calluses that form on our skin. <clears throat> I like having calluses. I don't like when I get to the place where my hands are soft. So I try to maintain my calluses. <laughs> How do you do that? Well, you better start working, right? Work with your hands and uh, uh, chop wood and uh, pull the weeds without gloves and, uh, you know, Lift weights at the gym, metal on your hands, and do all those things with your hands. And I guarantee you, you're going to have some calluses. Because that protects your hands. Because your soft hands, boy, you, you do something with your soft hands, you're going to feel pain just like that. So once the callus is formed, we can do things that previously, that would have caused us pain, but we barely feel it now. Do you know that your conscience is that way? The first time we commit sin, our conscience really is offended. You know, you, your heart may be throbbing and pumping and you're like, oh, this is terrible. 
The second time it hurts, but it's not as bad. And after a while, if you pursue that path of sin, you can do it without even being aware that you're sinning. You know, it's like a hitman. A hitman, they kill so much. They, 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 there's been stories about hitmen in the mafia that can, they can just shoot a man right in the face and feel nothing. Why? So calloused. So hardened. That's what sin does. And we do know that sin is in the heart. See, it's not just all about the externals, brethren. It's in the heart. And you and me, you and I, we deal with it. Don't say you're not a sinner and you don't have that sin lurking in your heart. You'd be denying the inspired word of God. You deal with sin. And there is that process of sin. And you know, James chapter 1 and so on and so forth. It is a process and it could, it could, you could disbelieve the promises of God. And your heart can be hard and you could be in a state of drifting away from the Lord. It is for us to take heed. Aren't you thankful for the church? It says in verse... 30, but exhort one another daily while his call today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And we could talk about how sin is so deceiving. Brethren, again, look at the words. Today, daily, exhort one another. Listen, that's where like uh, the word referred to the Holy Spirit as our comforter, as our helper, the one who comes alongside of us. Listen to me tonight. We need daily coming alongside and we need that ministry of the church. And I know, listen, the pastor can't do it. The pastors can't do it. The deacons can't do it. The Sunday school teachers can't do it. And this is a corporate responsibility. We all are to exhort the brethren. And exhorting is not coming up and tearing them up one side and down the other. It's encouraging and lifting them up and setting them aright through the word of God. We have two, two imperatives. We need to take heed, guard our hearts, and we need to exhort one another daily. Let's get busy in doing that. Aren't you going to be so thankful when you can get back? Amen. And you can fellowship like the Bible tells us. And you can truly exhort one another as the Bible tells us. Aren't you thankful one day? And we're praying for that. Aren't you out there praying that we can uh, come back to you? Let's pray for our governors. Let's pray for the decisions that are about to be made. And may God Help us to get back together. May God help us to see our responsibilities here in the body of Christ. And let's get busy doing it because we need it. Amen. And our brethren need it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we realize that everything is done through your grace. Through your power. It is not us. It is not our ability to accomplish all this, but we thank you for the power of your word that the inspired word of God that works in us mightily. Certainly it's, it's, it's the ministry of the word in us that keeps us from hardening our heart. It's the word of God, the ministry of the word preached to us and the ministry of the Holy Spirit speaking to us. God, we thank you for what you do in us through the preaching of the word and the ministry of the word and Bible studies and fellowship time and uh, Bible classes and Sunday school classes and children's classes, how much we need the word of God. And Father, we thank you also for the brethren, the church, 
We thank you that we can be encouraged one with another, that we can be lifted up, we can be challenged. And if someone sees that we're being deceived by sin, they can warn us. And Father, give us the grace to hear, the humility to receive and to obey when we are exhorted by your word. Lord, help us to grow. Help us to go forward with Christ, to, be, to really experience that rest that you have for us. We ask it in Jesus' precious name and for his glory. Amen.